Alright, welcome everyone. We're going to get started. We are now live on YouTube, so hi YouTube. If you don't want to be on YouTube, stay behind the phone. Um, but welcome everyone to the Bitcoin and Open Blockchain Meetup. I think I know just about everyone. One or two people back there. I don't know. Hi, I'm Hannah. This is Ian right here and hey, Chris right there. And you're the organizers. If you have any questions, let us know. Thank you for coming, organizers. If you have any questions, let us know. Thank you for coming out on a Monday. It's not our usual time, but this is when Jurek was here, so uh, we're so uh, we're delighted to have him come out and do a talk for us. Um, we do run off donations. So if anyone's feeling generous today, we have a Bitcoin QR code there and a jar for fiat. So we're going to do um, uh, a talk. Greg is going to do a talk, then we're going to do a Q&A session. Usually we head out to the bar after this. I'm not sure how many takers we'll have on a Monday night, but if anyone's feeling adventurous, I'm sure one or two of us will be at the bar down the street afterwards. So we're going to talk about down the street afterwards. So we're going to talk about uh, Perli Polis, um, which is also the Institute of Crypto Anarchy, which is where I get my cool shirt from. Um, they have a really cool conference there every year, uh, Hackers Congress, which I went to um, earlier this month, which was really awesome. It was a lot of fun. And there's this whole building, and I think you guys rent out this whole other space there. There's a bar, and they have this really awesome thing, which I have to show you all, which is their, their conference badge that you get. So, you know, they have an ATM machine there, a Bitcoin ATM. And I loaded this thing up with Bitcoin, and everything in the place you can buy with Bitcoin. So I was just at my hotel, and I'd show up in the morning, and there's a coffee shop, and you can get your coffee, and your tea, and your breakfast, and then you get lunch and dinner, and then there was a bar there, and so you just stay the night and do your drinking. So I basically just lived off crypto for a couple days just using this thing, which is a really insecure hardware wallet, but a really, really awesome conference batch. So that was a lot of fun. But we'll get down to business here. And uh, I'll tell you about Yureg. So it's Yureg Bednar is the co-founder of Paralini Polis in Prague and the one in Bratislava as well. Um, and I'll tell you all about what that means. But it's also a, uh, it's a nonprofit that runs entirely on crypto. So he's going to tell us a lot about how you pull that off, which is going to be a bit of a trick. Um, but Yureg is, a, aside from Prague, is interested in technologies that increase liberty. Um, he's founded several IT companies and works to help people exit the state system using cryptocurrencies. So please welcome her. Thank you. So maybe I'll start about the funny story from, uh, from the place. Um, there was a sushi place that was, uh, uh, that was serving sushi. And it was actually, uh, it's a, actually a small sushi place uh, next street that that just came over and uh, was doing sushi. And uh, when I was there for the first time, I asked them if they accept uh, any crypto. And uh, the owner just said, like, are you kidding me? I get this question like 10 times a day. We are just <laughs> uh, one block away from Parallel Police. Yeah. Uh, so now he has so many customers that just go back and forth uh, between the cafeteria and the sushi place that he said, okay, I'm not going to accept fiat anymore because it doesn't make any sense. I need cash register and all, all these things. Wow. Uh, uh, so he's completely switching to crypto. It's a very small sushi place, like three tables. But, um, nice. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we uh, sometimes run into problems with banks. So I'll start with a, a small project from Bratislava that we did. Uh, there were several uh, crypto companies uh, that um, had a problem because the banks closed their bank accounts. So these were uh, small exchanges, operators of Bitcoin ATMs, uh, and, a f and a few other companies. Uh, one was a payment gateway. Uh, so uh, in, uh, I think it was August, uh, all of these companies uh, got a letter from their bank, which were different banks, and they closed their bank accounts with no reason, just terminating the contract according to what they said, uh, the conditions of the contract, and uh, no other bank would open a bank account for them. So we, we, we kind of... Um, uh, made, uh, 
made this video uh, and this project where we enlightened the banks with a Bitcoin logo. So these are all the banks that close the bank account. So we were kind of going around the city. There's Trusted, it's a, uh, it's one of the gateways, a uh, few banks, so, so a few of these, um, these banks. And this video uh, became viral and people started writing us from different countries. Um, that they have had the same problem at the same time. So with this is the National Bank of, uh, of Slovakia, from Romero Science as well. Um, so what we do is we don't only operate a cafeteria that accepts only, only cryptocurrencies, but we try to engage with uh, the whole environment, again, trying to support uh, companies that are uh, doing uh, some good work in this space. Uh, so, first of all, oh, let's see if this works. Oh, this one. Okay. Uh, so, still doesn't. That is what I'd like. <laughs> so, never mind. I'll, I'll show you the. Oh, wait. Are we showing the right one? Because I changed the colors. The story behind it is that uh, we uh, we have an uh, uh, an art group uh, that is doing uh, some controversial projects uh, uh, like uh, stealing the president's flag from the from the Prague castle and changing it into red underwear, which has a, a lot of local uh, symbolism embedded in it. And um, we are I was showing uh, uh, me and my friend who is also working in IT security. We are talking to all these artists uh, about Bitcoin and what you can, can do with it, that you can maybe have uh, more anonymous payments, it's not uh, censorable and so on. And these guys are artists, they work, uh, they create sculptures, they, uh, they paint, they do filmmaking and, uh, and other artistic disciplines. Uh, uh, they're architects as well, and so the, the first thing they said, okay, uh, it's a nice theory, let's try it out in practice. <laughs> so um, we were kind of thinking uh, uh, about starting a small hackerspace uh, that is focused uh, on cryptocurrencies. We had one in Bratislava, uh, it was kind of uh, hackerspace like uh, like classical hackerspace with a 3D printer, we accepted crypto and did all these things. Uh, but if you give this kind of job to an artist, uh, they come, they see a three-story building, they sign a rental contract, and then they start thinking what to do with it. So that's what happened. So the first thing we did is we painted black and put up some signs and had to create uh, the whole philosophy behind it. So right now, uh, when you enter, uh, these are the parts that you see. I will show you a little bit uh, how it looks inside and then how, how it operates uh, and what is the philosophy behind it. So the first part will be just showing what the place is about and then how, how to make it work if you run a business or a non-profit purely on cryptocurrencies. So there's a cafeteria. It's the first crypto-only cafeteria in the world, uh, which is great because we get a 
a lot of tourists. Uh, we became a part of a few tours uh, of Prague and sometimes there's a, just a bus that stops on the street and there's a bunch of Japanese tourists, they all buy Bitcoin and then get an espresso and go to see Prague Castle. Yeah. Uh, there's a paper hub. Uh, it's a co-working space and now it's going to be turned into a startup incubator. Uh, we have a, like a crypto hacker space, which is basically a basement lab where people play with uh, Lightning Network to build some devices and so on. Um, and now it also hosts a YouTube studio, which was uh, broadcasting uh, from the conference. There are a lot of great interviews, so if you if you search for the conference, I, I can tell you later how to find it. Uh, we have uh, we have recordings of all the talks, all the Bitcoin meetups. We have hundreds of hours of talks, and also interviews now. So from the conference, there are 15 hours of interviews with all the, all the speaker uh, speakers. Um, then there's Institute of Cryptonarchy. Uh, that's a, a place where we do the meetups, uh, we do the talks, uh, we host movie screenings and uh, other cool stuff. Uh, it also hosts uh, uh, something that we call Club Parkopolis. It's basically a place for, for people to meet and talk about cryptocurrencies. Also, when we host events, we uh, organize uh, dinners uh, with the speakers, so the members of the club, uh, club can interact with them kind of, you know, in an uh, um, atmosphere of uh, fewer people. And then we do the Hacker, Hacker con Congress, was two weeks ago. Weeks. Um, so this is the bar uh, and the barista. Uh, what is different about the cafeteria, except uh, for the fact that uh, it uh, it is crypto only, is that we try to create a feeling that you are entering a parallel universe. Uh, so uh, there are many things that make uh, visitors a little bit uneasy. Uh, you couldn't see it uh, during the conference because it was kind of turned into a standard bar. But we only play Creative Commons music, so there are no record labels coming after us and you know uh, asking us to declare what we're, what we're playing. There's a lot of stuff uh, printed on 3D printers all around, so there's uh, these weird currencies that we are using, and there are a lot of parts that are made. Up of paper mache, so you can see the shelves there and so on. That the, the main reason is that we didn't have any money, so <laughs> when, when we started, so the art, artist and sculptor says, okay, what is the cheapest material that we can make furniture of? And that's how we did it. So even, even the bar is uh, uh, on, top of, uh, on top of these structures. Uh, so we got a truck of, of these actually, and we made uh, also the co working space, tables, and now we slowly change. We now have normal um, uh, tables, uh, and uh, the bar is also very different um, because you can walk around. It. So when you enter the place, there is no uh, person that is standing behind the bar because there is no behind the bar. You can walk around it from uh, from both sides. Um, so it kind of takes a while until you realize like who is the barista who's going to help you with this crypto torture and uh, give you coffee, but you can also talk uh, uh, talk with uh, the person that's making you coffee, how it's made, uh, and, and so on. So it's kind of like an open bar. That's, that's what we like. So this is the co-working space that's called the Paper Hub. Uh, just a few pictures, this is the terrace. Also here you can see we have uh, uh, ashtrays that are just printed logos of parallel police. It's, uh, it's also so this is the view. Uh, this is, by the way, a copy of the red underwear that uh, replaced the president's flag. Uh, it's not put there by us, so it's just people kind of putting it, uh, it up as a symbol of centralized power and it's kind of um, uh, became a symbol of protest against uh, uh, the idea of even having a president. Uh, is the institute, uh, sorry for the background, it's, it's not supposed to be like that when you're present, but it's just in a heavy mode. So yeah, it's, a, it's a room like this. Uh, um, so the idea is uh, that we have this cycle of 
people. Uh, so uh, people either learn from the internet or they just come and they see a cafeteria. They go to Bitcoin coffee. Uh, they they learn about cryptocurrency. Some of them are curious. They go to a talk. Then maybe they like what they heard and they can uh, apply their own personal expertise. So if the person is an accountant or a lawyer or a programmer, uh, they can say, okay, how can I apply my area of expertise to this cryptocurrency, crypto NFTs, liberty movement, uh, and create a project. So when they want to create a project, they, they, they either go to CryptoLab to play with uh, some technologies, or they try to go to Crypto Hub and create a company around it. And there, there have been a few of them. Um, for example, the second largest manufacturer of Bitcoin APNs uh, came through this cycle and kind of uh, learned, okay, uh, there's an ATM, it kind of sucks, so I'm going to make it anyway. Um, so what is the philosophy and what does it even mean? Uh, uh, usually when I wear this t-shirt or people wear this t-shirt uh, in different countries, people start, uh, especially uh, the drug dealers, start to run away because they think it is police. <laughs> so police means city and parallel means parallel. Means parallel. And uh, the philosophy uh, came from a uh, communist regime in Czechoslovakia. Uh, there was uh, a protest, there were a lot of political trials and people uh, um, were kind of put to jail for no apparent reason. And uh, these were completely political trials. So, so these people didn't even break the, the law that was uh, approved. Uh, they just uh, were kind of uh, not liked by the, by the communist uh, government. So they were put in prison. And a few uh, bands, maybe around 100 intellectuals, they signed uh, something called Carta 77, uh, which was basically uh, begging the government to uh, just apply uh, the laws and not, you know, make uh, make political trials. Uh, it was completely ignored, and there were many reactions to that. So, uh, one of the reactions was by this guy called uh, Václav Benda, uh, and he. Uh, realized that the only um, way that uh, that we can be free uh, uh, is uh, if we do it ourselves. So there are uh, different options. One obvious option is a revolution, and he said that revolutions are usually either expensive or violent, usually both. <laughs> so he said, "Okay, I'm not going to like I'm a I'm a math uh, teacher. I'm a Philosopher, I'm not going to kind of think, uh, uh, try to spark a violent revolution to get rid of the government. Uh, so what he said is that uh, it is maybe a better idea to use the freedom that we have, and that means that, for example, uh, the children have to uh, go to the state school. They will be taught communism. They will kind of uh, be molded into. Uh, 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 communist uh, supporting uh, working class uh, but uh, and, and this is mandatory you just have to send your kid uh, your kids there uh, but on the other hand uh, there is no law or, or actually no way uh, that would um, uh, kind of disallow uh, uh, people uh, to uh, create an evening suit, so people could gather in an apartment, in a kitchen, and there could be one of the parents teaching them something else, maybe how it looks in the West, or, uh, or, or a different version of history, or, or all these things. Uh, and when people meet in these apartments, or, or somewhere outside in the park, uh, they could also trade. So uh, second uh, thing was uh, markets. Um, uh, actually, uh, Vatsal Benda, he was kind of frightened because he realized that it's black markets because they're completely forbidden. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, he realized that this was the most important part because if people cannot trade, then uh, then they will never be free. Uh, uh, another part was information exchange. So uh, in communism, even uh, uh, even even among the uh, dissent, uh, information exchange was very hierarchical. So if there was an important person, a philosopher, they would get all the information which was copied uh, first and then they would slowly distribute it to kind of normal rebels. Uh, so Václav Benda said, okay, screw this. The information goes to the person that can make as many copies as possible in, in the shortest time possible and we don't care about hierarchy, we need this information to spread fast. And there was free culture, so underground bands and uh, underground theater and so on. So basically the idea of parallel police is not to change uh, the state, not to interact with the government, not to, uh, um, not to interact with the government, not to vote, not to create political parties, uh, but to just uh, express your own freedom, uh, wherever you can, wherever you can. So you would do everything that they want from you in order for you not to go to jail. But other than that, you would just express uh, your freedom and use it as much as possible. So this is kind of one pillar of what we're trying to do, and of course one of the. Uh, uh, one of the things that we are trying to do is we are trying to use parallel money, which is cryptocurrency. Uh, then there's crypto anarchy. Uh, it's very nice because uh, we put, uh, you didn't see it, but it, uh, the, the sign is typical crypto anarchy is actually at the top of the building. And most of the people, it also makes them uneasy because when they see the word anarchy, uh, for, for a lot of people, they just stop thinking there, okay, these things are going to throw Molotov cocktails at me or, I don't know, <laughs> try to do something bad. Um, and so, um, for those that kind of get past this, they get that it's a joke because uh, it doesn't make much sense to create an institute of something anarchy, it doesn't, doesn't make much sense. Um, and uh, the way we, uh, we think about it is that crypto anarchy and parallel police are the same thing. Crypto anarchy works on the internet, so it's a parallel police, parallel city on the internet. Uh, but we are physical people and we want to do the same thing in a, in a physical space as well. So, so these ideas of parallel cities, parallel society, and crypto anarchy kind of uh, uh, go very well together. Um, uh, the difference, there are many differences with uh, traditional uh, uh, kind of uh, ways to implement anarchy, from anarcho-communism to anarcho-capitalism. Uh, what we try to do is we are, we are focusing on things that we can do right here, right now, without changing the world. So our idea is not to uh, not to kind of uh, change the political system or overthrow the government. Uh, our idea is to find okay, what technologies can we use that will bring us more freedom here and now. Again, one of them is cryptocurrencies, um, uh, technologies that uh, increase anonymity, encryption, uh, and so on. Uh, if you're interested in a philosophy of crypto anarchy, I highly recommend uh, Smuggler's Talk. Uh, so if you if you put Smuggler, uh, uh, Parallel Police or Smuggler Crypto Anarchy, um, he has a talk uh, where, where he explains how it works and why why it is different, uh, uh, different to another uh, type of anarchy. So, um, this is the Crypto Anarchy Manifesto. I like to are, are you familiar with it? Have you, have you read it? I read it? Okay, uh, what I like about this is that it was written in the late 1980s. Uh, I think it first published uh, on, uh, in uh, 1991. Um, and uh, Timothy Simei is kind of 
explaining um, uh, how cryptonarchy and these technologies will, will change the world. And what I really like about this is that I think that this is a very vivid description of the present moment. So, so I think it all already happened. So it says that uh, these developments will alter completely the nature of government regulation, the ability to tax and control economic interactions, the ability to keep information secret, and will even alter the nature of the trust and reputation. The state will, of course, try to slow or halt the spread of this technology, citing national security concerns, use of the technology by drug dealers and tax evaders, and uh, fears of societal disintegration. Many of these concerns will be valid. Crypto anarchy will allow national secrets to be traded freely and will allow illicit and stolen materials to be traded. So you can see things like Silk, Silk Road, you can see uh, things like WikiLeaks, which kind of came from the cypherpunks movement. Um, uh, of course, uh, the reaction by government is all oh, drug dealers, terrorists, tax evaders. This is why they are trying to kind of uh, stop, uh, uh, stop this movement. So uh, uh, this is one of the uh, new uh, t-shirts uh, and movies that we are going to make. And I really like the idea because it says that uh, we are not talking about some future 10 years from, from now. It is happening in some small part of societies already today. Uh, another idea that uh, inspired us is hacking based temporary autonomous zones. I don't know if you read this short book, it's amazing. And it's kind of an exploration of how people create these temporary places, basically parallel police, uh, in different times. It talks about uh, Chinese tongs where people would uh, uh, provide uh, even things like social security to How it, how it is practically uh, done, what you need to do, uh, it, uh, how much you can and should interact with the outside world, and so on. Um, one of the greatest advantages of, of, of these temporary autonomous zones is that they uh, give you the ability uh, to live as if you're free. So at the place and time, you're, you're probably free. Uh, one of the examples of temporary autonomous zones, I don't know if it's uh, big in, uh, uh, in the US, uh, but in Europe you have, you have a lot of uh, free techno parties, where, which is usually a secret location, people would go there, and uh, yeah, there's usually free sale of psychedelics, uh, uh, and uh, the way people would do it is uh, that they would announce the location on Friday evening, uh, it would be on private property, so uh, it would be very hard to get a warrant because all the judges are enjoying their weekend. So police can uh, maybe wait uh, at the fence, but they cannot, uh, cannot uh, uh, enter. So this is another example of uh, how this could work. It's a project called Sea Studying, where you could uh, create uh, these platforms at sea, which are international waters. Uh, if you don't like your neighbors, you, you can just attach this one to, to a boat and uh, sail away to a different society. So this can become a temporary outcome so in the future. Right now people are trying this out uh, on, on, uh, on uh, boats. Um, these are not platforms yet, but this um, Another inspiration is hyperspaces. Concept, which we try to do with Parabolis as well. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, what I really like about hyperspaces, uh, there are uh, a lot of them, uh, more than 1,000 active hyperspaces, and they're very different. So, uh, for example, I was uh, in a hyperspace uh, in Dublin, and people were trying to decode British TV. <laughs> so that's, that's what they're what they were doing, kind of building satellite receivers and tr trying to get paid uh, TV. Uh, I was in a hyperspace in Tokyo where they, they were building these uh, small satellites to put on, uh, put on orbit. Uh, so they're very different and uh, a lot of significant hyperspaces. Um, we 
we had a lot of practical experiences. Uh, we had uh, uh, a lot of interactions with the state. Uh, actually, the prime, min the current prime minister of Czech Republic uh, visited parallel uh, police. Uh, then he denied it on TV. Uh, we have a picture of him buying Bitcoin and uh, taking a selfie with his private key uh, on a paper wallet which someone stole and then returned back, <laughs> just as a proof of concept. Uh, and uh, what is really interesting is that uh, because they know that we are not uh, uh, doing something bad, we are not uh, kind of uh, organizing overthrowing of the government or, or doing, doing something like that, um, all the time when they try to attack us, it backfires because the media say, okay, uh, this big government is trying to destroy this small non-profit that is just trying something new. So, so it has been a very interesting dynamic. Uh, one of the things is that we have a, a, in, a, in Czech Republic, uh, we have something uh, that's called uh, electronic submission of transactions. So if you buy something at any store and you pay cash, uh, uh, the merchant has to send the transaction to the Ministry of Finance immediately. Uh, then they need to give you a receipt and the receipt uh, needs a confirmation number uh, from the state. So basically the state knows about all the transactions. The goal is of course to enforce taxes. Uh, there are many problems with it. Uh, just a funny story is that uh, when, uh, when the, uh, the Prime Minister was back the, the uh, uh, head of the Department of Finance, um, was in parallel police, there was uh, Andreas Antonopoulos, and uh, we kind of didn't want to talk uh, to the guy, not to Andreas, but to the, the minister. Uh, so we kind of put them together and uh, <laughs> say, okay, you guys talk. And Andreas was talking, he explained how Bitcoin works, and, uh, and uh, Prime Minister replies, oh, so this blockchain thing, that's basically what I'm introducing because you need to confirm all the transactions centrally in our state database. So you get a, like, a, like a hash uh, or, a, or receipt of the transaction. So you didn't get it. Um, we are the only place in Czech Republic that is publicly boycotting it. So we said we are not ever going to submit you our transaction. There is no way. We have a way to, uh, to counter it uh, if that becomes a problem. Uh, so we have some strategies on how, how to still keep operating even if they try to enforce it. Uh, but the thing is that they don't try to because they know that uh, it, will, it will backfire. There are of course a lot of bars, small restaurants that don't do that. But they, they would never do it that publicly. We wrote the blog, we called the journalists, and we're saying we're never going to do it. Um, another thing is that if you only accept cryptocurrencies, uh, you need to uh, kind of uh, test uh, what works and what doesn't, usually in real life. Uh, so for example, when we started, a lot of people would use uh, old wallets that couldn't spend unconfirmed transactions, which is a really, really a problem because if a customer comes, we explain them that uh, we are only using this, uh, you know, future of money and the great cryptocurrency. Uh, they would buy them at the ATM, and then they would need to wait 10 minutes for a confirmation, uh, sometimes 15 minutes uh, back then. Uh, so we had to kind of find which wallets uh, allow you to spend on transactions. Uh, we experienced uh, high fees, uh, uh, which was a huge problem for us. Uh, first of all, people who were uh, trying to pay uh, $2 for an espresso, uh, paying $6, uh, $6 for, uh, for a transaction that they were not very happy about that. Uh, the worst uh, thing was when they didn't pay six dollars for a transaction. That means that a transaction wouldn't confirm and the coffee was free because we didn't get paid. Uh, so we had to kind of quickly implement uh, Litecoin. Uh, so that was an experience. 
experience. Uh, then, uh, as, a, as this great crypto anarchist cyberpunk place, we decided, okay, let's accept Monero, it's anonymous, it's going to be great. Uh, it's not very great for our use case because uh, you cannot spend unconfirmed transaction uh, in a protocol. It's not possible. It's not a problem of a particular wallet. It's just uh, not possible. So people would buy it uh, uh, and then uh, uh, wait for it's around 20 minutes in Monero and, uh, until you can spend it. Uh, then they would buy coffee. Uh, they would uh, drink their espresso and then when they see this great cake, uh, they would want the cake, but their change that came back to their wallet didn't confirm it, so they would have to wait another 20 minutes. Uh, so that's not very nice. Uh, we tried Lightning Network, uh, doesn't really work, same problem. Uh, uh, the time until you open a new channel, if you don't have any Bitcoin at all, which a lot of people don't, uh, you need to uh, wait for 40 minutes after your, until your incoming transaction confirms, and then your channel has three confirmations, and then you can use open network. So, not good for, for our use case. Uh, we played with paper wallets, so some people didn't want to install an application on their, on their phone, they wouldn't have enough space available, they, or they didn't even have a, like a, a App Store account or Google Play account, and so on. So we had an option for them to create uh, paper wallet. Uh, we were issuing NFC, so so the wallet that Hannah showed you showed you uh, is a is a kind of the latest iteration of that. But we we had something that looked like a credit card, uh, which was not very secure. Uh, this one uh, only works as an as an NFC if you press the button, so it's, it is at least a little bit more secure because you just uh, cannot just scan people, uh, but uh, but you need to do physically something to show the private key. But uh, all it is, it's basically private key written in NFC, so it's not really secure. Uh, so we are trying to do something with it. Uh, people have been trying NFC plans, so they would pay just by waving their hand. So this is our um, uh, point of sale system, and people would have an implant in their palm, and they could pay with it. They can also, if they're a member of the maker space or the club, uh, they could uh, they could open doors with their hand. Uh, so it's kind of cool. And the reason they've done it is uh, that. Uh, there is uh, this talk uh, about uh, you know, putting chips uh, into people. Uh, there, in Europe, uh, if you want to travel with your pets, uh, you need to implant a chip uh, in them. There is no other way. It's basically a passport. Uh, and we said, okay, we're going to, of course, uh, protest centralized chipping of people. But you're in a much better position if you're protesting something, if you actually know how it is like to have a chip in your hand. Uh, by the way, it is much easier to get it out than in. Uh, getting it in is a, it's a needle. We, uh, we hired a guy from a, a, a piercing studio and he was implanting them. Uh, getting them out, you do it uh, with just a, just a razor and it's basically like an acne, just take it out. It takes 10 seconds. So it's not for life. Uh, but it's a, it's a great experience and you can talk to these people that they kind of upgraded their body and they can do something that most people cannot do. And if they find themselves naked uh, in the desert, they still can buy coffee. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, we were doing this for a, for a few years and then we decided that maybe it would be a good idea to kind of expand it out of one community and uh, let other people do it. So what we, what we did is that uh, I don't live in Czech Republic, I'm from Bratislava, Slovakia. Uh, so uh, I kind of uh, uh, took uh, some of friends, uh, put them together, and said, okay, we're going to do the same thing in Bratislava, so we're opening a new one. Uh, but we are not only opening a new, new place, 
uh, but we are also decentralizing the concept. So in the same way as hackerspaces, they have all their uh, know-how, how to start a hackerspace, what are the best practices, they have it online for anyone to use as a template. So as we were starting it, we, we were kind of putting down uh, how this works, what, uh, uh, what you should do, why we have a cafeteria, why we have a, a co-working space, how these uh, spaces interact with each other, what kind of events you can organize, uh, how to make it work economically, how to get money and so on. So we were kind of putting all our know-how out there. Um, and we hope that people will uh, start more of them. Uh, there is one project in another city in Slovakia, uh, Košice, uh, where people are trying to uh, open one of, uh, uh, one of these places as well. We are talking with uh, people from a few more cities that are trying to do this. Um, uh, we think that uh, it is very important to keep the small scale, so we are not trying to create a huge international organization. So all these, uh, the idea is that all these spaces are independent. Even the one in Bratislava, there is no shared uh, ownership structure. So uh, it's actually a non-profit, so no one owns it or uh, the organization owns itself. Um, but like we don't have to uh, report anything, it's not a franchise. It's an open source franchise, so we basically give you the logo, all the ideas, and then we keep the right to uh, write bad things about you if you do stupid things like uh, take uh, money from the state or something like that. Um, but we really think that it's important to keep it in a, in a community where people would just walk in, they, they, they could interact together and so on. Um, we are kind of uh, experimenting with even more internal decentralization in Bratislava. So right now we, are, we don't have uh, anyone that is truly responsible for any part uh, of the space. So there is only coordination. There's a lot of volunteering, but there's no boss. Uh, so this is uh, what we want it to look like. So this was the vision. Uh, one of the members of the core team uh, was an architect uh, who designed it, and she uh, she was um, I kind of uh, found her through uh, uh, social networks, and she said, "Oh, I like I'm doing my work. I'm an architect, and in the evenings I'm watching these uh, talks from Prague about politics because we live stream most of the talks." Uh, so she said, okay, I, I really want to design and build this physical space. So she joined the team and we had an architect. So what is really great about doing a non-profit like this, that it's not a bunch of IT guys uh, coming together and uh, doing a cool startup or something like that. Um, what attracts people is values. So, uh, so we have a lot of entrepreneurs uh, that are on our board. We have people who are doing different things: education, architects. Uh, one one guy has a company that is building uh, playgrounds for kids. It's it's different things. Uh, and what uh, attracts these people are values. So that's really nice. So we found this old. Uh, house. Uh, uh, as you can see uh, at the beginning there were not uh, many of us so uh, a lot of these people are there two or three times. So it's for example the architect. It's, it's uh, one more maybe. Uh, I'm not on this picture, I'm sick at the time but uh, uh, kind of this is uh, that was uh, five or six of us that were working on the project at the beginning. Uh, uh, so we were like logo and so on. Um, then uh, the first thing that we did uh, in this place after we uh, signed the rental agreement before um, starting the construction was to uh, do a crypto flea market so people would trade stuff for crypto. Um, that, that was a lot of fun. Uh, we had a lot of people coming in um, and uh, this is how it looked month ago. Uh, this is uh, our, uh, our friend Pavel is explaining how to uh, 
get rid of your tax residency and move it to uh, some nice place. Unfortunately, this doesn't work for Americans that well, if you're citizens. Uh, but for all the other people, it's also uh, great. Um, so basically, we have this one, uh, one house uh, here. Uh, in this part, there's a, uh, there's a cafeteria. And like we have a co-working space incubator which turns to Institute of Crypto Anarchy at 6 p.m. So that's the result that the place is not as large. Uh, the part up there we call the moon. So if you if you walk, uh, you can increase your the value of your crypto holdings by going to the moon. Uh, you, uh, food, parties, uh, biohacking, uh, uh, we, we started similar to chapter in Bratislava. So this is how it looks. Now the part uh, about how to run the business on crypto. So this was more about place and the philosophy. So um, <coughs> uh, if we have to convert uh, the cryptocurrency to uh, euros or Czech crowns, uh, we still try to, uh, to keep it in crypto as long as possible, so so we don't use uh, bank account that much. Uh, actually, I, I don't know if we currently use it at all. So um, we try to uh, pay suppliers for crypto. So we have found people who are willing to sell us coffee for crypto. Um, our landlords agreed to receive part of the rent uh, in a Litecoin. Uh, so suppliers, employees, of course, are paid only in crypto. Uh, the reason is that if they are going to explain uh, to, uh, to the visitors that they can only pay coffee in crypto, they need to understand how it works and they need to have a practical experience. So, uh, so employees, uh, conference tickets or tickets for, uh, for events are only paid in cryptos. By the way, this is the worst business strategy ever. Uh, so if you want to run a cafeteria or, or, or an event venue, don't do this because people would usually just, uh, you know, walk away or don't buy the ticket and, and not come. So this is an experiment. I'm not recommending this strategy. Um, uh, the problem is uh, that uh, someone buys coffee uh, and we need to uh, buy some more, but the crypto that we got falls 20% the next day and now we lost our profit margin and then some. So how do you pay the employees at the end of the month? How do you uh, pay the suppliers? Um, it's a real problem. Uh, uh, in Prague, uh, it was a real problem uh, a few times until we realized how to deal with it. So this is how we deal with it. But anyway, so um, let's say someone pays for a product or service, let's say it's coffee. Uh, part of it is our cost, which goes, which pays the suppliers and the employees. Part of it is profit, which we can keep as a matter, it's just a wallet. And part of it uh, uh, goes to another wallet, uh, which is a capital fund. So, uh, from this money, we try to we, we finance, uh, you know, coffee machine, furniture, all all the capital investments that we need. Uh, so uh, we have uh, we have two strategies, uh, and they're basically completely opposite. So for the cost side, uh, the easiest strategy how to deal with volatility is to have as short accounting intervals as possible. So instead of worrying how you are going to pay the employees uh, at the end of the month, you pay them every day. Uh, so during the day, the, the volatility is not so high. Uh, so sometimes they, uh, sometimes we pay a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less, but, but the volatility is not that high. Uh, so the exchange rate is basically the same uh, uh, during the day. 
uh, also, uh, if we have to pay suppliers, we try to pay them as soon as possible. So if we get a net 90 days invoice, if we can pay, we pay immediately, because in 90 days our crypto can be worth, I don't know, 30% less, and then, then we could go bankrupt. So for the cost, as short accounting intervals as possible. Uh, uh, profits you can just keep, that doesn't matter that much. Uh, but with the capital fund, we do the exact opposite. Uh, so that means very long accounting intervals. Uh, how does it work? Uh, so there's money coming into this capital fund, crypto. Uh, uh, we remember what was the exchange rate crypto when we, when we uh, put it into the capital fund. Uh, that means that we know, uh, let's say, the, the buying value of all the crypto that went in. Uh, and uh, we only spend it if the value is 30% above the price uh, that it cost us. Uh, so uh, that means that, uh, first of all, uh, we get 30% discount on capital, on all our capital investments. Uh, so that's very, very nice thing, uh, because the competition doesn't have this advantage. If we have competition, I don't know. Uh, what, do you, uh, what do you give up is, of course, predictability. You don't know in advance where, when um, the price will be 30% up. It doesn't mean that it needs to go 30% uh, up from one moment to, to another uh, because uh, uh, the capital fund is funded, uh, let's say, daily. Uh, so the, the uh, fluctuations, they kind of smooth out. Sometimes the crypto is high, sometimes it's low. Um, so this means that this strategy works if crypto is volatile. Uh, if it's not volatile, then we don't have to deal with volatility. We are happy with a stable coin. <laughs> uh, if it is volatile and it is not a smooth down, right, down the right, then this strategy will always work. In fact, I have modeled it. Uh, I, have, um, I, I have found that uh, even in the worst days, uh, if you start with this, it's uh, back when Bitcoin was uh, 1000 and then it fell to 200. If you continued uh, for at least a year, you would still get to a point where where uh, it would go 30% up um, uh, from the price that, that uh, was the cost. So, um, so these are the two basic strategies that we use. Uh, we didn't go bankrupt yet, uh, although we had some more bumps on the road, which I will tell you about uh, in a short while. Uh, but we also do these strategies. So um, uh, we use first IO. I don't know if you know first IO. Yeah, perfect. Do you use it? No. So basically, it's a it's a way to save 15 to 30 percent of anything. Uh, that you buy from Amazon except Kindle books. Uh, the way it works is that uh, first creates a liquid market with Amazon gift cards. So there are some people who get Amazon gift cards, they either win it or they get it from their employer as a bonus or something like that. And uh, the problem with Amazon gift cards is that you either use it all uh, or you cannot use it at all. So there are people that uh, that want to just sell them and they want crypto for for money and then there are people who are buying it uh, for uh, for US dollars, let's say. Um, so uh, the way it works for a customer is basically you create a wish list on Amazon or you just use the search box and search for anything on Amazon. Uh, then uh, then you enter your shipping address. Uh, you choose your discount, which can be 15 to 33 percent, and uh, you create an order. And this order stays in the system until someone takes it. Uh, if you set the discount to 15 percent, they will probably take it the same day. So it's basically uh, like any order on Amazon. 
Uh, if you if you set it to thirty percent, you might wait a few uh, more days, uh, but it will eventually uh, someone will eventually take it. Uh, of course, um, there's a small catch, and the small catch is that uh, the people who are taking your order they will wait until the crypto is down because they want as much crypto as possible. Uh, so what to do? Of course, uh, when they take your order, you buy back your crypto with fiat uh, in the same exchange rate. Uh, so you kind of don't lose uh, uh, this discount. It's also nice because uh, there is no credit card transaction. So it's more anonymous. You're still your address is in Amazon. But your bank doesn't know that you're buying it and how much. So um, we use this to uh, buy uh, a lot of things that we use in the cafeteria and that we sell to customers, which is really nice because we don't need uh, difficult wholesale agreements with suppliers. We basically order it on Amazon. We just get it cheaper. Uh, but I think this is one of the things when you talk to people about Bitcoin, uh, you know, you can start with uh, all the state is evil, they're tracking you and they're printing money and, you know, dollar is going to shit and, and all these things. But it's much easier if you start, oh, you want to save 30% on your purchases on Amazon, this is how you can do it. So, so I think it's much nicer way to introduce cryptocurrencies to people. Uh, but, um, it really works. It works for uh, for uh, 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 I I bought my po phone like this, and so usually the, even the merchants don't get thirty percent discount. So so it's like better than uh, wholesale. Uh, what we also do, not very interesting here, maybe maybe with sales tax. I don't know how it works here. Uh, but for example, uh, value added tax in Slovakia is flat twenty percent. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, it is 6% for food, which is what we need uh, in our cafeteria. So even though we can go to a shop next door and buy something, we would rather order it from, from the Netherlands and pay 6% 6, 6 tax uh, instead of 20. Uh, so that's what we do. Uh, I like to shop here in the US because your sales tax is much lower than our EAT. So uh, my friend uh, gets uh, a lot of packages and then I bring them home and uh, I, I save a lot of money because I don't like paying, paying taxes and I especially don't like paying taxes to Slovak government. So uh, I'd rather support any other government. So if you combine these two things, you can do 30-40% savings, which Great. Um, okay, so with the Bratislava space, uh, it was not as simple as signing a rental agreement and moving in. Uh, we had to build the place, so we had to invest a lot of money into construction. It was an empty, an empty space, as you saw on the flea market photo. Uh, so uh, we had to pay suppliers. Uh, which was great. Uh, the only problem was that we raised most of the money, money uh, at the beginning of this year, so January to March. And then uh, while we finished uh, all the construction plans and so on, the, the, the value of the money that we raised in crypto, of course, uh, thanked to one third or one half. Um, so that was a problem because we didn't want to sell the crypto, uh, which was half the value. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we kind of found, found a way uh, to not sell the crypto and still build the place. Uh, so, the, uh, so we created uh, home-based collateralized loans, a uh, very fancy name, basically we uh, we told the community, hey guys, we need euros to pay the construction workers. We have this crypto, we don't want to sell it. If you are willing to borrow us some money, we will, we will give you the crypto in the same value as a collateral. So, you know, we are a non-profit, so uh, 
uh, we cannot you know, show any income or anything like that. So we gave them uh, the bitcoins. These were trusted people from the community. It was not random people. So we gave them the crypto. Uh, we agreed uh, when we are going to repay the loan. If we are not repaying it, uh, the people are, uh, of course, uh, welcome to sell the crypto and get their money back that way. Uh, so it is very low risk for both sides. Uh, although if the crypto falls down, we should uh, refeed the collateral, so, so the, the other party is safe. Um, the only problem basically is that the capacity is limited when because people in the community have some, some free money but the, the money is not unlimited and also we don't have unlimited amount of cryptocurrency. Um, of course, bank is not an option, especially after we made that video, they kind of don't like us <laughs> and we are light. Um, so, um, so that was not an option. So, at some point, uh, we ran out of this possibility. There were not no more people who were willing to um, give us any more money. So these were our, our options. Uh, find more uh, funding. We're still doing it. We we actually uh, also have recurring funding from our uh, board uh, board of uh, directors who are paying our uh, uh, like a monthly fee to be on the board. Uh, we could sell the crypto, which kind of doesn't feel right still. We're still waiting for uh, for the prices from the beginning of this year or end of last year to come back. Uh, we could apply for some EU grant scam scheme or a state subsidy, which kind of doesn't feel right with the whole idea that we are doing. And we like to walk our talk. We could do an ICO. Uh, we haven't done it, uh, it's not a philosophical problem, we were mainly just lazy, you need to create a token and market it and, and uh, it's a lot of work that doesn't move us to our goal fast enough. So, uh, or we could uh, you know, avoid paying invoices and order stuff and say, oh sorry, we don't have money and so on, uh, or uh, steal a dishwasher or something like that. Uh, we don't really like to do that because we like to have uh, happy customers and we don't, it's probably not the best idea uh, to kind of uh, um, not be a good business partner to suppliers and so on. So we were thinking one night and uh, very kind of, uh, uh, well, you know, so, so if the state doesn't have money, what do they do? They just print it, right? <coughs> so we said, okay, that's the way, we'll print money. Um, we didn't want to do an ICO, so how do you print money? We ended up printing US dollars, so this is uh, really nice, and I, I, I still like doing it. So since December last year, uh, you all can print US dollars. You don't need to be a bank. And uh, it's a happy week. Uh, so, so you can uh, print uh, fiat that is backed by cryptocurrencies. That is, by the way, how most of uh, uh, of the US dollars or any other fiat currency is created. It's, it's, it's backed by collateral, uh, which is usually a uh, loan, maybe government bond, maybe a mortgage. And uh, that's how banks create it. So uh, we started using a project that is called DAI, uh, and uh, it's part of a larger project called MakerDAO. Uh, so DAI is a stablecoin uh, that is backed with the collateral of Ether. Uh, so the way it works is you lock in Ether in a smart contract. Uh, you need to keep it at least 150% of the money you're going to print. 
and uh, otherwise it will just go to auction. So you, you never want to uh, kind of let it slide below 150%. Um, and so you lock in the collateral, and then you can ask the smart contract to create these new DAI coins. Because it is a stable coin, the value of one DAI is one dollar. So that's how you bring it US dollars. It doesn't matter if you call it DAI. Uh, by the way, there are uh, also other kinds of US dollars that are not uh, created by Federal Reserve. One of them uh, is Euro dollar. So in Europe, we have a, also a copy of a dollar that we trade internally, and it has nothing to do with the Federal Reserve. So it's not the first. Um, first project that uh, brings money, but uh, these euro dollars are created by European banks. Uh, so if it has a value of one dollar, it's basically one US dollar. So this is how how to do it. So you basically lock in uh, ether. You should lock some more ether over the 150% because uh, you, don't, you won't prevent uh, the liquidation. Uh, then you ask the smart contract to mint new DAI. You get this, you can trade this on any exchange uh, that has DAI, which there are at least eight of them. Uh, at least one of them, which is called Oasis, is decentralized, so there's no AML. You can just change it for Bitcoin or for anything else. So we basically turn it into euros, we drew it, and use it to uh, pay the suppliers. Uh, so you can do this as well. So if you want to hold Ether, but still kind of uh, uh, use part of the value that you locked in Ether uh, to finance your vacation, consumption, anything, uh, you can uh, you can meet new die and, uh, and and you can do it this way. So what you are doing is you are keeping the upside of ether uh, while still consuming part of the value. Uh, the way it works. Uh, so how how do you get your ether back? Uh, basically, you can uh, uh, you can buy die, which is one die is one dollar. So so you re return value. You pay a small interest rate uh, on the loan, and then uh, ether is unlocked. Uh, you don't need the whole amount of DAI because you can unlock part of the collateral, withdraw it, uh, buy uh, some more DAI for it, and so on. So, so you can kind of unwind this loan even if you don't have DAI. You just keep the, uh, keep the upside. Uh, so this allows you to do many more things. Uh, I will show you two more. Uh, so if you, this one uh, I call whole heart. So what you can do is, uh, again, lock some ether, mint a new die. Uh, but with this die, you buy more ether or Bitcoin, which you can also hold. So you're kind of uh, multiplying your upside. It's basically a market-based leverage. Uh, if you buy more ether, you can do it a few times more, so you can lock that ether back again in this uh, smart contract, mint more die, and, and do a few rounds of this. It's not infinite because uh, you need 150% collateral, so you're not minting the same amount of ether as, uh, of, of die as you uh, so our strategy is um, again we had uh, we had this crypto uh, that we didn't want to sell and we needed to pay uh, for the construction. Uh, so we wanted to mint uh, basically hundred percent of what we put in. Uh, so we found another uh, another person who wants to uh, hold ether. Uh, in our community, uh, we converted all our crypto to, uh, to interest and we put together with this other person 200% uh, collateral, which is kind of safe if the, if the inter goes a little bit down, it wouldn't wipe down or liquidate that loan. So uh, now the inter is locked, 
we mint the DAI coins, we pay for the construction, pay the invoices, and um, still keep the upside. So we're waiting until until Ether goes to the next moon happens. And what we do is uh, when we unwind the loan, we split the profit on the Ether with the holder. So we keep half of the upside, not the whole upside, because we already spent the time. Uh, it is fair because uh, this is the same amount of upside that, uh, uh, that the other person would have if they if they done this loop. So it's basically uh, fair for everyone, no one loses any money, uh, and uh, it allows us to kind of keep part of the upside. So this is how it looks. Uh, there are two people. A is Real uh, Napolis, uh, B is some other holder. Uh, we meet, uh, uh, it dies, we spend it, and when, uh, when the ether goes up, uh, we return the die, so part, part of this part, uh, this value is destroyed. Uh, then we divide the upside, uh, we receive all the ether that they put in, and they get half of the upside as well. So I, I will sh share the slides. I know that you know going uh, around with these boxes is not as easy to follow. So I don't want to uh, tire you, but this really works. We bought a fridge. It's like we physically have a furniture and uh, uh, <coughs> stuff that we needed to pay with these newly printed uh, die dollars, let's say, that are backed by cryptocurrencies, which is even better than normal dollars, which are backed by nothing, uh, or a government bond, which is nothing. Uh, all right, uh, benefits. Uh, so what happens if Kitter goes down? Of course, uh, the, uh, this person to liquidate the loan, we just lose this part, and it's for, for parallel Napolis, it's the same as we if we just sold the crypto. So uh, if it goes up, we split the profit. Uh, is how to do it practically? I will not go through this. I will just share the slides and uh, you can see. So the result is that uh, we kind of uh, attracted this great community volunteers, we have some sponsors, uh, we have some entrepreneurs uh, who kind of form the board of advisors and they're kind of trying to power this whole ecosystem. We have some donors who uh, gave, uh, gave us some money to kind of uh, uh, make this all possible. Uh, well, it's never fully finished, but uh, we opened uh, two weeks ago officially. We uh, or we have been organizing events there in Bratislava for two months now. The Prague space uh, is five years old now, so, uh, so this is the fifth year. Um, and uh, we hope that we can continue operating and building these parallel societies. Um, just to recap, uh, we tried our two strategies, which is short and long accounting intervals for operational expenses, short uh, intervals for capital expenses, long intervals. Uh, we created some home-based collateralized loans. By the way, there are some smart contract applications now that allow you to do this uh, on Ether, but we have Bitcoin and uh, kind of people want more, more Bitcoin than Ether. And we have found a cheap way to finance uh, our, uh, our capital expenses uh, with DAI while still keeping some upside of the grants. So that's good. Um, and uh, just a short rant uh, about stability. So uh, we don't use the, the stability feature of, of DAI because we immediately spend it. Uh, so we don't care if the bag holds, if it works, uh, doesn't matter to us. The only thing that uh, 
that measures is the, the price of ether. Uh, and uh, I don't think that, so, so if you, if you kind of run this, uh, a business fully on cryptocurrency, uh, you kind of lose this idea that the world is stable and you know the prices should be fixed and so on. So I don't think that there is a real stability. The, a, a banana in January and in June doesn't cost the same. It shouldn't cost the same because uh, uh, because there is a different uh, supply. Uh, so. Uh, it allows you to think in a different way. So you're not kind of focusing on, okay, stability, stability, uh, do I get my paycheck every month and is it the same? It's really not because, okay, your paycheck might be the same, but the prices in economy change all the time. Uh, so, so if you just allow um, yourself to do this, uh, you kind of try to uh, look at the world differently. Also, in some economies, cryptocurrencies are very stable. Uh, in Venezuela, uh, in, uh, uh, even in Turkey, maybe in Argentina, that had like four huge inflation in 20 years, uh, crypto is really stable. So, so it really allows you to keep your value, even if it goes uh, up and down uh, 2x or 3x. Uh, still better than the, than the fiat currency that they have. So uh, kind of uh, appreciate that uh, we live in a, an economy that is much better than most of the world. Uh, if you uh, do this in your personal life, which I accidentally have because uh, I had, uh, uh, I saved uh, some money in cryptocurrencies, then it went down, I didn't want to spend it. So that means I spent all the fiat. So I found myself in a situation when I was living fully on crypto myself, which I didn't intend to do. Uh, but it's a great experience because uh, you, you look at things really differently and you really understand that the price, prices are not stable and I don't think they should be stable. So uh, we decided that we change our mindset and we consider the volatility a feature, not a bug. <laughs> uh, so we, we are not trying to fight it, we are trying to make use of it. So for example, the uh, long accounting intervals strategy is good for a personal life as well. You go to a Bitcoin ATM, you buy uh, Bitcoin with $100 every month. Uh, so after 12 months, uh, you spend thousands to hundreds. Um, on crypto, if the value is 30% or whatever number you decide in advance, more than, uh, than 1200, you go to vacation or you buy whatever you want to buy. So, so you can apply this strategy in your own uh, personal life and uh, you can make use of this volatility. So last slide that I always do when I talk about parallel police is that can have your own. I kind of made, a, uh, made uh, this uh, idea where, where you can put it. Maybe you can find a little bit cheaper real estate, <laughs> but uh, don't be shy and uh, uh, you can start. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you attract a lot of people that have really good values and uh, uh, you can build uh, careers around that if you are uh, uh, if you are into crypto, into startups, uh, you can you can create a, a lot of interesting companies. Uh, uh, you can learn how to make good coffee. And uh, as Pamela Morgan said, uh, every city needs its own parallel police. So um, maybe there will be one in Chicago. If you want to learn how to do it even more, you can write me, and we have a, we have some. Um, some information online on how to do it. So that's all from my monologue. And I hope you have some questions. Thank you. Questions, anyone? You know which African countries are stable? You know which African countries are stable? No. Which is stable? 
you said, you said African countries too, do you know which ones? Uh, are not stable. Zimbabwe, for example, was not stable because they had hyperinflation. Uh, I mean, stable currencies, not, uh, yeah. So uh, in Zimbabwe, there was hyperinflation, uh, kind of as bad as Venezuela, actually. And what they did is that they eventually gave up and they said, okay, uh, use whatever currency you want. And uh, what, the, what people ended up doing is they started using currencies of neighboring countries and U.S. dollars. So you can actually use U.S. dollars. So, so basically, I'm just curious. You said that the U.S. dollar is not stable. Uh, Bitcoin, uh, but you're saying that no, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Monero. Uh, that's that's the main. Uh, I think now they started accepting in Prague Ethereum because they Ethereum in the okay. developer conference in Prague. I'm not sure if they pulled it off. Um, and they accepted a few more. But uh, so, so, the, uh, so the percentage is that uh, more than half of the, of the amount that people pay is uh, paid in Litecoin. Uh, maybe 30-ish percent is Bitcoin and the rest is all the others. So usually people don't pay with anything else than Litecoin and Bitcoin. That's, that's the majority. But, uh, sorry, what? So I, I was kind of answering that it, you also, you're accepting just a bunch of, uh, of the Bitcoin or the uh, uh, cryptocurrency, including Ethereum. Uh, and that's how you're getting some of the contracts to actually pay for, or the uh, ability for the DAO to pay through uh, minting fiat currency. Uh, in your case, it would probably be that you would be minting more or less euros rather than USDs, where here you'd probably be. No, because DAI uh, only has has a back to uh, USD okay, right now. So it's they're, they're planning, so so uh, I really like this project, uh, uh, so uh, I think at the beginning of the next year they will be launching um, a version of DAI, which is called Multicollateral DAI, uh, that will support uh, another forms of backing, so different tokens, not only Ether. And uh, I think by the end of the year, they said that they want to create a DAI that is back for, it will be called something else, but a token that is back to Europe as well. But right now we don't care what it's back to. Okay, so basically the DAI, the DAI coin is actually backed by USDs. No, it's not, it's backed by Ether. Okay. But uh, the value uh, mirrors USDs. Okay. In the, so there are market mechanisms. Okay, so you basically just, the ether itself is it, you're, it's backed by ether, but you can actually exchange it for USDs. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, <clears throat> I guess my question is, pretty much what happened is you guys created some like a sub coin. So I understand the DAI stable coin is something that was created, but you already got the ether and so forth. So you also created another currency that, like you said, is backed by the e by ether or whatever. Or Cryptocurrency that you have, and that's something in your subset that you utilize, as you said, to spin in and utilize. But you're not going to try to keep that coin around. They're just like a virtual or temporary coin you're utilizing yes. to do your day to day. Yes. If you still whatever profits you're making, you put it back. You being backed by either, so you convert it right back to cryptocurrency that's on the market right now, which is pretty kept up. Because I remember Donald Trump, but when nobody get upset though with Donald Trump using other people's money, he. He always claimed he had money, but he used, he borrowed other people's money to make his money, and that's what seemed like what's going on with this one, even though yours well, is back. We, yeah, so we have the collateral. So we right. we didn't right. invent, invent new money. We were just able to keep the upside right. and still uh, spend. But we had to raise the money. We didn't you know, right. invent it out that's of the net. That. So that would be an ICO. If we did an ICO, it would be right. basically uh, printing money. That's I just have so for your collateralized debt positions, you're like transferring in a die, you put in half of the stake, and then you have some other third party who's doing that as well. Well, that's easy. I'm sorry. Because like my understanding is that they lock half of the collateral, 
yeah. you receive 100% of the die and use that to you know, pay yes. some funds. So, and so like, basically, yeah, if, if uh, it ends so up being under collateralized and liquidated, then um, it was as if you sold, but for them, they lose all of it. Uh, uh, no, because uh, if it falls down, uh, you can actually liquidate the loan peacefully and that they they get uh, what they put in back in each oh, okay. so they're keeping the uh, the value in each they don't care about the day value and they just get back that the each which has lower value but that's what they would mm -hmm. do anyway and what's the upside for them is that um, after um, uh, so if we close this position, uh, let's say ether goes to X, they get uh, their ether back uh, from the smart contract, uh, and they get half of what was left uh, from the Paranapolis ether. So why this? Uh, because if they did this on their own, if there was not A and B, uh, uh, this this would be the set, uh, this would be the profit because if if they did um, right if they did this if they if they minted die and bought more ether mm -hmm. this is what they would end up with because they would still put in two hundred percent so uh, so it's not liquidated um, that means that uh, they half of what they put in. Uh, they would uh, mint and buy more history. Mm -hmm. So they don't lose anything uh, in both cases. They're just overexposed to both the upside and downside. But if they did all these things, that it would have the same properties. And technically how we did it is basically uh, we have uh, created a dump contract. <laughs> so we basically wrote down, okay, these are the rules. This is the name of the person that put in the eater. This is the name. Uh, oh, oh, this is Parana Police. This is how much they put in. These are the condition. If uh, if the value of eater drops to this, this is what happens. If it goes up, this is what happens. And uh, basically, both sides agreed with it, that, uh, signed it, and, and and it's a contract that is known in the community. Sorry, for the capital profits portion that you're holding on. Um, do you try to, when you're spending the other capital, do you say, okay, I'm holding this coin, it's going to go into my capital portion, or do you just say, whatever is left over the 30%, we allocate it evenly based off of what we got it and hold on to that? Or are you exchanging some of your Litecoin into Bitcoin or Bitcoin into Litecoin or something like that for the long term? Uh, so in Prague, I'm not charged uh, of, of the finance, so I don't know what they do okay. because I don't live there. Uh, in uh, in Bratislava, I'm always uh, because we have uh, a lot of traders in the community, both in Prague and in Bratislava, actually. So I always ask them what should we do, how how should we, you know, should we sell Litecoin, buy Bitcoin, and so on. They never give me any answer that uh, would uh, tell me what to do. Uh, so we don't do anything. We just keep it the way it came, yeah. and the way it came is that. Uh, 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 as I said, most of it is Bitcoin and Litecoin. Yeah. The only time when we uh, changed uh, crypto for another crypto was with this scheme because we didn't have, like, we had like 0 0.05 Ether <laughs> to begin with. So we had to change everything to Ether in order for this to make it work. We have actually uh, a lot of Bitcoin maximalists in our group and they did, really didn't like the idea, but then I said, okay, do you have a better idea? Should we just sell the Bitcoin? And they said, okay, okay, maybe it's not <laughs> such a bad coin and we can try try this. Uh, but um, uh, we don't have uh, any good strategy for kind of predicting which coin. Yeah. Yeah. I think also the, the fact is that the, right now, either and uh, the EOS is probably the only two cryptocurrencies that are actually related to smart contracts. Uh, uh, no, you can, uh, uh, I don't care that much about smart, smart contracts, so right. I, I care about DAI because that's what we use, right. but uh, I didn't choose Ether. I really like Ether, I like the smart contract platform, I, I think it's a good piece of software. 
I've never seen you, so I don't know. Uh, but uh, this is not true. Uh, you can run uh, via Rootstock. You can uh, run uh, inter smart contracts uh, that are running on top of uh, Bitcoin. Uh, so, so you can do it with Bitcoin, but they didn't launch DAI, and we need a liquid market for for DAI. So it's not only about deploying the technology, but there needs to be a market where you can sell it, uh, exchange it for something else, because you actually need someone that wants to buy DAI. That are usually the people that are repaying the the, the loans. So, uh, yeah, but I I like the idea of smart contracts. Not as much as uh, a lot of other people do, um, but it's not about uh, picking the technological winner. It's just about okay, these guys made it. It runs on uh, uh, on Ether, so that's why we use Ether. No, I, I, like that. I think from what I've heard so far, it seems like most of the smart contracts are really running on uh, Ethereum or Ether, and uh, I think that there is uh, EOS, which is kind of like it's just really kind of very new and most people are not really sure of it but it's more, it looks like it's more for defining markets rather than uh, rather than kind of like designing general contracts um, yeah. I think it might be a good idea to, to wait until after to get really, really deep into smart contract platforms okay well, I'm sorry about that uh, well I have, oh go ahead no, no, no. I'll wait until everyone else is asking so I'm, I'm curious how you manage trust so for, for instance, you said that one of the ways that you combat volatility is by paying smaller amounts more frequently. And so, you know, like having, do you have like a single person in your organization that controls your wallets or is everything multi-sig and you have to like assign everything with multiple people many different times every single so, day? Yeah. Uh, so we do that uh, more on a social level than on technological level. We started with a three or five uh, uh, multi-sync, which was a really bad idea because if someone sent us $10, uh, the fee for three out of five multi sinks was $20, so we couldn't stand out. It was not like it would be just us, it would just disappear. Uh, so we learned it the, lab, the hard way. Uh, right now what we do is we use Trezor and there are a few trusted people that have the same wallet restored on, on their Trezor. Uh, so there are more people than, than one that can do a transaction. Uh, everyone sees the Xbox, uh, so, so they see what transactions are happening. And uh, uh, But the, the issue of trust is more interesting on a social level. So we, um, we are a pretty open organization on the outside. Anyone can come and uh, drink coffee unless they work for the state or our police, which is explicitly forbidden uh, by our private club membership rules. Uh, uh, by the way, we had two visits of police during the grand opening because we were kind of loud. Uh, it's not going to happen again. We don't want to uh, argue with the neighbors. Uh, but um, on the inside, it is much more strict. We were inspired by a smuggler's um, idea and talk about uh, crypto tribes. Uh, so we basically create um, an entry cost, which is a social cost. Uh, that means that it is not easy to get into the inner circle. You need recommendations, people need to know you. Uh, you need to kind of build trust within the community. So. We are open in a way that we, we uh, so if someone wants to become part of the community, um, we kind of interact with them more, we get to know them, we ask their friends about them and, and so on, and then we let them in. But it's not uh, fast, it's not, you know, someone raises their hand and says, okay, I want to be a member and, yeah. and just get in. Um, also, uh, the fact that uh, it is not easy to get in, uh, means that uh, being in has uh, more value. That means that it is much easier uh, to transact within the community uh, because if you do business, uh, and we have a startup incubator, so we do business together, uh, at, at least uh, some of us do business together, um, 
it is more than than just uh, you know we do business and if it doesn't work we go to court uh, because uh, if there's a dispute within the community and in in Prague there have been a few disputes uh, they want the people want to solve this dispute they want to stay members of the community they they don't want to you know uh, piss everyone and, and uh, leave because they spend a lot of energy to stay within the community. Uh, what we also do is we are um, clearly defining the, the rules within the community and also the way to uh, that we solve disputes. Uh, so we are creating this uh, parallel legal system. Uh, so the rule number one of the community is uh, do not call police ever. Like if someone steals from us, we have to uh, solve it ourselves. Because if we are trying to build a parallel society, we cannot rely on uh, uh, on police coming and solving our problems or courts doing that. So we we have to uh, have to find a way to solve disputes and uh, kind of uh, reach uh, uh, find where justice is ourselves. So one of the projects that we are working on it's on our GitHub is um, uh, like a set of minimal rules for the people that they all have to accept and uh, process how we uh, how we uh, how we uh, like an arbitrage process of uh, of solving disputes. So like who decides it, uh, what it's based on, how to make sure it's uh, it's not biased and so on. So. Uh, so with the wallets, uh, uh, we are still quite poor. So frankly, there is not so much to steal <laughs> right now, uh, and uh, it's based on trust. But the trust is not, uh, you know, you seem like a nice guy. Uh, so we trust you. That there is some <coughs> kind of social process behind it. So, so we hope it works. We are still young, and especially this part is very young. So. So I was wondering if somebody was actually wanting to, uh, to let's say they were in the conference, but they they didn't want to join the group because they're only going to be there for a couple of days, but they they wanted to have like something in the cafeteria. Is there any way that they could like uh, you know take their fiat currency, convert that temporarily into Bitcoin, and then spend that in the cafeteria? Yeah, we have an ATM at the entrance, so most people. That okay. come, they don't, they don't have, a, uh, they don't have a crypto, and uh, it's not only that they can buy it, but the baristas and people that are there, that they are actively trying to help them. So, uh, so if someone comes and they look confused, and uh, a lot of people uh, are confused, we call it crypto mass. So we have. A, like uh, uh, crypto priests that come and they explain why are we doing these crazy things and uh, if they are successful that people won't run away in the front of the door and uh, actually go through this whole process but yeah that's kind of the point uh, and the reason that uh, we are doing it this way is that uh, you can do a one hour or two hour talk about uh, how great crypto is and how you can use it and so on uh, but it is much more effective to do a five minute version where people buy their own crypto and they end up with something they bought with the crypto and if they have an experience uh, they should learn it better than uh, with uh, listening to someone for an hour okay and then well, i'm going to take a turn actually okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. sure um, I, I'm curious, what was the experience like working with the suppliers? Did you have, did you find suppliers who already had uh, accepted crypto in the past, or did you call, did you help some suppliers with their first transactions? How did that? Do you talk about that a bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, in uh, in Prague, um, um, so I'm uh, I'm not really sure how exactly it went, uh, because we had a supplier uh, of coffee, then we had another supplier and so on, but we ended up with uh, with a su supplier that was uh, uh, accepting Litecoin. It's a really good uh, cafeteria and roastery in Amsterdam. 
and uh, it's funny because um, they're accepting Litecoin for wholesale and they're uh, I don't know if, if they uh, learned it from us or how, how did this happen because I, I wasn't part of the process but um, when you come there physically uh, they accept only credit cards and Bitcoin and so I came, I said, okay, uh, perfect, I want coffee, they have amazing coffee, uh, so I ordered uh, some flat whites, some cake, and when I wanted to pay, uh, I, uh, I said, okay, I want to pay with Bitcoin. And they said, oh, that's interesting, no one tried to pay with Bitcoin for like months. So they kind of took the, the point of sale system for Bitcoin, threw dust out of it, tried to make it work, uh, they didn't make it work. Uh, and they, uh, they were kind of asking, uh, like, uh, why is that, like, why, why people don't pay? And, and, and um, uh, the reason is, of course, because the fees were so high, people stopped paying with Bitcoin at all. Uh, so they were asking us, so, okay, so what do we do? Uh, and, and we said, okay, you guys are already taking Litecoin for wholesale, so that's, the, that's even better for retail, so you can do that. Uh, with a landlord uh, uh, in Bratislava, he's, uh, he's kind of a cool guy, he's, uh, he, the, the piece of real estate he has um, is his kind of side thing and he's doing uh, things in IT, so that was not a problem. Um, but uh, uh, there are uh, so a lot of things like furniture, fridge, uh, and uh, uh, Basically, all the things there is a large uh, retailer uh, similar to Amazon that is operating in Czech, Czech Republic and Slovakia, uh, and uh, they uh, they started accepting crypto uh, by you know, that they were talking to us and we kind of convinced them. And it's very interesting because the moment they started doing them uh, do, uh, accepting crypto. Um, people from all around uh, Europe started buying mining equipment from there. So GPUs, uh, computers, motherboards, everything, because they found, okay, we don't need to exchange it to euros uh, on a centralized exchange and uh, getting reported. So they basically sold all, all of the mining equipment that they had done stock in like 24 hours after they announced that they are accepting crypto. So it was like a really good business move for them, at least for that day. <laughs> um, and then uh, with the employees, uh, we don't want employees that don't understand crypto because those are the people that have to convince the customers to pay in crypto. So, so it's basically a good filter. There are many really good baristas that make amazing coffee, uh, and, but they don't get crypto and they view it as a problem. So if their perception is that this is a problem, uh, then we maybe take a little bit worse coffee and uh, rather have people who understand it and, and uh, perceive it as a feature. Uh, in Bratislava, we didn't have this problem, so we have a really great uh, uh, head barista who also taught many of the members of the community how to make great coffee, so we are kind of all happy about it. Um, uh, the, the guy that helped us with it has a, has a cafeteria of his own, uh, has a roastery, and he wants to accept cryptocurrencies now because he's kind of um, getting used to it. Where uh, the cafeteria is open for maybe two or three weeks only, uh, so we, before that we only did events, so there's not so much experience in Bratislava, but Uh, we have uh, something that we uh, call survival manual, uh, which basically says uh, what kind of decisions can be made by an individual. Uh, the basic rule is that if it doesn't kill the project, <laughs> or if, if it's not a threat to the whole project, then any single individual can make a decision. And the way uh, that we uh, that we do it is very similar to how hackerspaces do it around the world, and uh, it is called ectocracy. So 
basically the idea is that those people that show up and do something, they get to decide decide how it's done. Because you can, you know, you're deciding, you're, you're painting the wall, and you can have, uh, you know, a long voting about, uh, you know, what color the wall should be and so on. And that takes a lot, lot of time and unnecessary discussion. So basically the idea is that those people that show up to paint the wall, they decide what the, what, what the color will be. If it's a big decision like, uh, I don't know, signing the rental agreement, which could make or unmake our, uh, our organization, then everyone votes. But we try to avoid voting as much as possible and kind of uh, try to convince to people to be responsible and uh, make good decisions for everyone. Um, this is something also uh, related to creativity. Uh, so uh, my experience uh, uh, with, uh, with the Bratislava space is that um, if you make decisions like this, it is very refreshing to most people. Because people are used to uh, go to a job, uh, they uh, they have a boss, and the boss tells them what to do. And when they come to an organization where uh, where they can volunteer, where, where no one tells them what they have to do or uh, or cannot do, um, it feel it feels uh, great, and people want to be part of this community. Uh, but that's uh, that's um, uh, kind of like the first step. So people experience this, they like this, uh, but then there's another step, and uh, these are the people, uh, I would say, uh, starts uh, at 10% of the people, but uh, we hope to grow this number. And uh, these are the people who uh, not only volunteer on the task that someone puts out there, but they figure out what to do. So, so, uh, so these people are creative. So they uh, they make use of this freedom and think think of something and say, okay, I have an idea. Let's uh, I don't know do bulletproof coffee in the cafeteria or let's put out uh, gymnastic rings and these things. And uh, this takes a lot of training, and we kind of uh, try to. Uh, uh, to motivate people to do this because uh, uh, people have great ideas and all of them have great ideas uh, but the problem is that they're they're not uh, they're not very uh, self self confident I think it is uh, really like a, a way to change people from the inside if you remove this hierarchy but what I'm saying is that it's not enough just to remove it because it is nice, people love it, but then you need to kind of uh, take the next step and uh, create a, an environment where, where people actually feel great uh, about creating and doing things. So now, um, uh, uh, and, and it also um, requires something from others. So um, I'm usually very critical about uh, things myself. So, so when when I don't know when someone, uh, let's say, uh, uh, changes the design of a website, um, I might not like it. Uh, but if I'm not going to change it to something else, I'm I'm not saying anything. I, I say, okay, it's perfect. You used your creativity and it's uh, uh, great job. So, so a lot of times uh, uh, people would criticize others because they themselves would do things differently, but they didn't do them at all. So, so, uh, so of course there's always room to improve, but the way to improve is not to say, okay, uh, the way you did it is not good enough. Uh, the way to improve is it's okay, you did this, and I'm going to build on top of that, on top of that change something and make it even better. So this is a process and uh, this is, I think, something that um, contributes to the lives, of, of the personal lives of the people that are part of the community. And, and there is a lot of value in that because uh, people spend a lot of time, there's a lot of energy and there should be something besides 
part of the whole community that they get back in nature. And I, I think this is one of the most important things that people learn uh, in the community. All right, cool. I think we'll wrap it up there. Yeah. Um, we can do more questions later. All right. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye, YouTube. How do we stop it? Stop the YouTube. There we go.